Welcome everyone to our Stearns Financial Group live simulcast of interesting people in interesting times. And today we have a real treat, uh, a very interesting person who lived through some very interesting times, uh, Chris Musselwhite. A little background on Chris. Uh, Chris is a, a very successful entrepreneur. I met him uh, as he was building his business, Discovery Learning. Uh, but this isn't the story of him building that business. That, that in and of itself is an interesting story. This is the prequel to that, is all the things that happened to him in childhood that built up character, uh, that wonderful thing that we say, you know, character building, uh, some things we might have wished we didn't live through, but certainly prepared us for different things in life. And he had a lot of those. And he wrote a fabulous book called Barker 10 Mile. He did it for his grandchildren, and he'll tell you more about that. And so it's, it's an interesting story of how to transmit, discuss values, family values from generation to generation. We have a lot of clients who are trying to figure out how to do that. How do I keep the stories going? Is it a book? Is it a video? Is it uh, just you know stories around the Thanksgiving table? What is it? And uh, again, I think Chris has hit on something here that some of you may find very interesting. Uh, I will say that when I read the book, I thought, holy cow, this is a new Mark Twain has been born. And uh, <clears throat> the adventures of Tom Sawyer. I mean, it, it is a very entertaining read. Chris, welcome. Uh, Tell, tell us how you got started on this adventure. Okay, good morning, everyone. Yeah, I, uh, after I sold my company and kind of went semi into retirement, I was thinking about uh, what, I might, what I might do yet next. And I just um, kept uh, getting this uh, urge to tell these stories. I had, at the time, I had four young grandsons. Uh, I now have four grandsons and a granddaughter. So the, the project started with, with writing for my, for my grandsons. And then they got old enough, I started telling them some stories and they seemed very interested in the stories and would ask me to tell them again and again. And so uh, I decided maybe I should write two or three of these down. I had absolutely no intention of writing a book. Barker 10 Mile, stories from the edge it ended up being 14 short stories so it started out just with an effort to to get on my computer and write four three stories that i specifically uh could remember and uh in and to realize that the place i grew up i grew up on a tobacco farm in southeastern north carolina and it was it's just a place in a time that doesn't exist anymore and it's so different and it's so far and so different from the world that my grandsons were living in that I just thought it would be nice to try to capture some of that uh, and communicate that for them. And then the other part was that they, they really only um, know me as an old man with a little bit of a limp. And so I thought it would be you know kind of uh, fun to let them see me at their age and they sort of, and for me to go back and think about what my life was like at uh, their, their age. So that was kind of the impetus, I guess, to, to, uh, to get started. Uh, and then and we can talk a little more about the process of actually doing it if you want. But uh, I think that, that's kind of a, the background, Dennis, on why I made the decision to do this. And it, it's one last thing I would add is that at some point, uh, it just felt like something I, I had to do. And uh, I've tried to listen to those urges over, uh, over the years and it, it just felt like I needed to do it and I didn't need to, uh, maybe I made up some reasons to do it, but it, the bottom line was I just felt compelled to do it. <laughs> well, and I, I think you had mentioned to me before that uh, the pandemic actually uh, gave you additional impetus because uh, you weren't, maybe doing everything you would be normally doing to. Yes, yeah. that's, that's true. I, I started the stories prior to the pandemic 
but um, I think the pandemic really uh, provided some structure that I needed to find the time to sit and do this. I, you know, it was, uh, I'd have to say that all in all, the, you know, the pandemic was, has been, was fairly kind to me. <laughs> and, uh, and that I, um, a lot of things that I, I liked that I gave up, like time with friends and, and dinner groups and all kinds of uh, travel, um, also meant that I had this time uh, to figure out how to structure and what to do with it. And it just seemed that it provided the space for me to spend more time focusing on the stories and, and getting that done. And in a time when everything probably felt a little out of control, uh, it gave me a way uh, and, and that it would, was pretty easy to um, feel very negative about what was going on. It gave me uh, something kind of constructive and creative to do in that space that I think was really good probably for my own mental health through that time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, certainly the statistics now of, of mental health suffering in this country and actually around the world are, are staggering. Um, yeah. many, many of our clients who are in that field say they've never seen anything like it, yes. um, even close. And so, yes. uh, yeah, so that uh, it turned out to be a brilliant way to help help you with your, your it was It was lucky. I don't think it was intentional, but it, it certainly did. Uh, it, it worked that way for me. Uh, one interesting little bit of background, uh, you know, I hear from time to time, uh, either clients or friends say, oh, I couldn't write a book or I couldn't do something else that, you know, would do some of this because of whatever. Um, one of the things Chris has said I can share, because he shares it actually in the book as well, is that Chris has both dyslexia and ADD. And, you know, there are many uh, examples in history of people with ADD who figured out how to focus that energy and do amazing things. I have not found as many examples in history of dyslexia and ADD where they've been able to have uh, a career like you had, Chris, or been able to do a book right. like, like this one. So uh, I just wanted to let the audience know, well done and whatever is standing in your way as an obstacle, maybe there's a way around that obstacle. Yeah, I, I, I would say if you, if you have interest in writing your stories, if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> Very it just good. takes yeah. some, some work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and so uh, why don't we uh, jump in? You know, what are some of your favorite stories and, and why? Okay. Uh, the, uh, one of the things I can do is, is share, there are 14 stories and I, I won't burn you with all of those, but what I would uh, like to do is just highlight on a few of those that are uh, probably my favorite, uh, some of my favorite stories. And I, they're all my favorite stories, but the, these are the ones I've selected and looked at, or I, I'd like to read like, you know, a paragraph or two from a few of the stories that I think would give you a flavor for, um, what the story is about, but also can show you the progression of the story. So the first story starts when I'm, uh, it's called Impaled, starts when I'm five years old. Um, and I go all the way through till uh, I'm finishing high school and about to sort of launch out into a different and a bigger world. So the stories just are about the expansion of a, expansion of a, a very small space uh, you know, which was my farm and my farmhouse to a bigger community, bigger community, and bigger community as we, as I, as I moved through um, some of the stories. The, uh, the first story is, um, is, is impaled, as I, as I mentioned, and it, it literally is about uh, me um, and my sister, who was two years younger and at the age of five, uh, I, uh, we go out into the farmyard and we uh, my mother's doing her spring cleaning, so she's very distracted. 
and we uh, go into the hay barn and I manage to climb the ladder to the top and then I can't get down unless I jump. And um, I end up, uh, I'll, let me read a paragraph from the story and you'll, you'll, see, uh, you'll see what happens um, in, in the process. The loft consisted of a narrow balcony that stretched around three sides of the barn's interior. I cautiously slid on my bottom across the rough lumber inch by inch to the very edge and swung my legs over. Below me was a sea of loose, unbelled hay. My sense of up and down was faltering. My heart raced. An invisible force pulled me ever closer to the edge against my will. I wanted to crawl back to the ladder, but knew I couldn't possibly make my way down. The only way down was to jump. Imagining the barn below was filled with spectators, even though it was only Paula peeking over the door threshold, I mustered all the courage I could summon and let the invisible force pull me over. My body, followed quickly by my stomach, found the spongy landing I had anticipated. But a moment later came the piercing pain in my right foot. So I had landed on the pitchfork that someone had left in the hay. And so, so that, that's the event of the story. Um, the, so there, each of the stories tends to have an event, and then there's the story that surrounds that. So the event provides an opportunity for me to tell the story of trying to get my three-year-old sister to go get help because we're out of earshot of my mom. Uh, and... And then my imagining all the things that she encountered between the barn and the house, which gives me a way to tell about what that space was like and what was happening there. And, and the fact that there was a, uh, a, a renegade rooster that would attack her at times. Uh, there was the well in the backyard that we had to pry a pump where we got our water from. Uh, it was a pretty for existence. So it, it, the, it provides a way to give them a sense of that time and space when I was five years old, uh, as well as being rescued finally from the barn and, 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 and what happened uh, there. But it is the, also the very, uh, the most insular of the stories. It is the one that is closest to the, the, the farmhouse and the, and the farmyard. And perhaps the closest to you dying <laughs> as well. Yeah, it could be, yes. Because <laughs> your, your little sister, she tries to go in and tell your mom, who is completely distracted by uh, cleaning the house. Yes. She tries to tell your mom, but she leaves out some details, like the fact that you're bleeding to death. And, right. and she comes back and tells you, mom says, you know, later. <laughs> yes, yeah, she's, a, she's, she's totally uh, unconcerned. She has no sense of urgency or a problem. She wonders, she finally gets in, in goes into our house and tells my mom that, uh, I, uh, that I want her to come out to the barn where I am. And my mother says, well, you just tell him I'm busy. I can't come. You'll have to come to me. So she comes back and says, mom says she won't come. You need to come to her. So I have to condense her again to go back. So it takes about three iterations of this, I think, before my mom finally decides she should come and uh, check and see what's happened, so. Yeah, and unfortunately the attack uh, rooster didn't, didn't show itself during this or, or your sister might have been waylaid and we might yes. not be having a conversation. Yeah I, yeah, I knew very well if the, if the rooster decided to attack her on this day that she was, I was gonna be the, le the least of her worries and probably the last thing she thought about for quite a while, so. Yeah, yeah. But it, it also is a, a little bit about, uh, it starts to paint the picture of this time and space and this place where um, for better or worse, there was little supervision. There was, a, you know, you were, you were allowed to go and do and explore. And, um, and, and, and that's a theme that I, I think will, um, that, that sort of is repeated through the stories oftentimes on a bigger and bigger uh, and sometimes more dangerous scale as we move yeah, forward. Well, and, and how did any of us survive growing up, you know, without uh, seat belts and a whole variety of other things. So, yeah. And, and well, I think, I, yeah, it, like, yeah, it brings up a very interesting question of today's 
parenting and, and some of the clients we have who are grandparents who they get into discussions with their children about, you know, what, how far do you let them go to explore the world, potentially see danger, as opposed to protect them from everything. And I, I think you have woven some interesting messages into that and I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 maybe particularly as a, a kid that grew up with attention deficit disorder, um, there was um, something, uh, I've, I've always been a person that if you could tell me I shouldn't do something, but until I, until I get burned, I probably will continue to do it. So the advantage for me in some ways was that I had space to make mistakes and, and feel the consequences and adjust my own behavior in some ways to, to compensate from that. And I don't, I, I, maybe the world's a more dangerous place today than it was then, I'm not sure. But I, I, I do think uh, that there's something to be said for letting kids make mistakes and fail and suffer, feel real consequences of that. Uh, in, in the anticipation that they will, uh, that they, they do adjust and they learn <laughs> and they uh, figure out other ways to do it. But I, I also know that's a, that, that's a, a, that's a, that's a, a real probably delicate balance. And, and that doesn't seem to be the um, modus operandi that I see these days. Uh, and maybe that's urban living versus rural living, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, and we we have dozens, probably, well, actually maybe hundreds of examples where the mom and the dad are not completely on the same page about this either. Yes. Um, yeah, and forgetting about grandparents who may be right. on completely different pages. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so what are some of the other stories? Well, a, a, a second one is they called uh, July Christmas, and uh, it's it, and these stories. Um, I I tried to be really honest in these stories, and and I just wanted to tell some of the stories to my grandsons. Honestly, I don't know that I was uh, necessarily trying to transfer any values or or lessons. Uh, I just kind of wanted the stories to be as authentic as I could as I could make them, and that meant that some of them I, I get hurt, uh, some of them there's danger, some of them there's bullying, and some of them are really funny and entrepreneurial in a sense. So I wanted to tell all of those. July Christmas is more a, a, a little bit of a darker story, and it is about bullying and abuse. And again, my younger grandsons, uh, I, some of these stories I haven't told them yet. I, I think, you know, I, I think there's an age of appropriateness. And so this is one that the younger kids, I don't think have heard unless their parents have chosen to read them to them now. The older, the older ones are, um, who are like 11 and 12, I, I think have heard these, um, these stories. But again, it's, it's an age old, uh, in some ways, an age-old issue and problem that certainly is is relevant today as well. The event uh, was uh, an attempt by my uh, older cousins to kill me by feeding me what they thought were poison berries. I still don't know quite why they wanted to kill me. I think it had a lot to do with uh, family dynamics beyond me and my understanding. My um, I, I grew up on a family farm. Uh, my dad's family farm where he had 10 brothers and sisters. So there were lots of relatives around and lots of people who would come back for holidays and events and family gatherings. And so there were lots of, lots of cousin. And there was a bit of a caste system that I started to recognize in the family, particularly among people who had moved away and people who kind of stay uh, with the, and on the farm. So but my, uh, one of my dad's sister, my Aunt Flora, was um, 
sort of the queen of the princess of the family. She had finished this little high school there where they, they went to high school, moved to New York City to go to modeling school and became uh, a successful model. But she loved coming back to the farm and she would come for three weeks every July. And uh, it became, it was like, it was better than Christmas. It was the most special thing that happened every year. So that's sort of where the name July Christmas um, comes from. And uh, she somehow brought, let me just read a little uh, excerpt from, from this. It's just one paragraph that I think kind of gives maybe a better flavor for, for my relationship with her than I, I think I could just describe. I'm talking about my Aunt Flora. She was the most celebrated member of our family. And during this July Christmas, everyone vied for her attention. When she was around, I went from being one of the insignificant ornaments that was relegated to the backside of the Christmas tree to a spot on the front, on the front bow. I felt seen. I vividly remember the time she scolded one of her sisters whose son, one of my older cousins, was bullying me yet again. It isn't acceptable for your child to behave this way, Aunt Flora reprimanded. I can still see exactly where I was standing under the china berry tree in my grandma's yard in the feeling of surprise and importance. The princess had come to my defense. No one had done that before. So uh, the, the book is a lot about some interesting family dynamics. It, it is about uh, sort of my, my place in some of that and some of the consequences and and, and the bullying and what I think would be fair these days to call um, to call abuse. So, well, and and I was struck by one of the things that happened with I think it was your cousin Marshall. Yes. Who who seemed to have a bit of a devil streak or or maybe even called it an evil streak. <laughs> I'd call it evil. Yes. <laughs> okay. And. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so you were out walking, and he had his pellet gun, and he was shooting everything in sight, and and you wanted to go back into the house. He didn't want you to, and you knew he was going to shoot you with that pellet gun. So yeah. what happened then? Well, it was uh, my my aunt Louise was planning a birthday party for my cousin, and she was making homemade ice cream and homemade cake, and I we were playing around in the field waiting to be called to the party. And when she called us in, uh, I turned to go and Marshall decided we weren't going. And Marshall was one of the, probably the, the main instigator of the abuse and the bullying. And he was, I, I perceived him to be quite um, dangerous. I mean, in the story, I talk about the different animals that he would kill that I would see happening. So I, I knew he was serious. So I just slowly, I, it was early in the spring, I still had on my winter coat. I slowly zipped it up, pulled the hood over my head, cinched everything down, covered everything I could cover, and then just turned and started walking towards the birthday party. And he probably shot me a hundred times in the back and got more and more angry as I kept walking. But it was um, it was probably my one uh, my my one big victory over my uh, nemesis. <laughs> And I wasn't going to miss the ice cream, the homemade ice cream and the birthday cake. So, and and how could you not succeed later in life? You know, you, <laughs> <laughs> you dealt with Marshall. Yes, I know. <laughs> you faced you faced Marshall and you, <laughs> and you survived. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, well, before we get into uh, the uh, nuts and bolts of how you did this, which I think will be of interest to some of our audience. Uh, other stories that come to mind that you think would be good to share? Let, let me give you a story that has a, a little bit of a different, a, a, a different, bit of a different flavor than than July uh, Christmas. This was Dusty and the Jet, and uh, the event was me basically destroying my dad's vegetable garden, which was incredibly important to him, and uh, we really depended on that for our for our food. I mean, we. Either we raised it, it was the vegetables we raised and my mother canned and froze or the, um, the, the animals that we slaughtered on the farm was pretty much the source of our, our food. And my dad 
loved his garden. He was out in the garden. We were plowing it. He was plowing it with um, a mule named Dusty, who was the mule of the farm mule. And I was always out with him, following him through the garden. And my mother came out and wanted him, uh, needed for him to come inside for a few minutes. And we were in a garden beside the house. And so he uh, handed me the plow and the reins, which I had to pretty much reach over my shoulders to, to, to get. And he said, whatever you do, don't drop the plow. So he leaves and I'm fine until um, a jet, for, we, we were just south of Pope Air Force Base in Fort Bragg. And the, in those days we were starting to see these low flying jets that were coming over. So a jet zoomed over so low that I could see the insignia on the side of the plane and um, scared the life out of me, but it really startled Dusty. So Dusty starts moving. And first he's moving down the road between the potatoes and then he decides to make a turn. So uh, he, uh, let, let me just, let's see here. Uh, so it says, Dusty lurched forward uh, and started moving. I'd never seen him so animated. He never walked this fast. The plow balancing on the thin steel blade wanted to fall to one side or the other. Keeping it upright was a challenge, but my dad's orders had been clear. Do not drop the plow. So I held on for dear life. At first, Dusty stayed in the road between the rows of potatoes where my dad had left us. But soon he decided to make a right turn, which pulled the plow across a row of potatoes. The plow dug deep into the row, and I looked down to see a dozen small potatoes lying in the gash created by the plow. Perhaps sensing my lack of control, Dusty moved faster and more erratically. The plow cut through row after row of tomatoes, corn, beans, peas, cucumbers, watermelon, and okra. The outer edge of the garden was bordered on three sides by ditches, which drained the surrounding fields during heavy thunderstorms. Each time Dusty approached a ditch, he simply turned in a long arch and crossed the garden at a new angle. It took all my might to keep the plow upright through the turns. All I could think of was my dad's admonition, don't drop the plow, don't drop the plow. This was the most important job I'd been given since holding the antenna for the UNC Kansas basketball championship, and I was completely focused. So the garden was, by the time my dad got back, the garden was pretty messed up. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was interesting what your dad's reaction was to it, right? It was, it was, it was, it, and it probably was some, somewhat typical. He just took the plow. He didn't say anything. He just took it and started trying to fix things. Uh, but there was a, a pattern of that, of, of me doing things either dangerous or getting into a bit of doing some damage. And um, often there seemed to be no uh, reprimand for that. It was, it was a bit of a, uh, it was the opposite side of that, you know, get out and, and do it and learn uh, on your own. And, and fittingly, um, I was there when it didn't work, I didn't really have consequences from then. It was just up to me to figure out what had worked and what had not worked. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I was struck by some of the stories of anxiety that you had as a youth. Uh, certainly the bullying piece was uh, a lot of stories around that. Uh, but also when um, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis was happening, yes. and you, you were be you know, a lot of families don't even allow their young kids to watch CNN today. But you were watching um, the two trusted news people of the day talk about what could happen. And you were worried about what if they drop a bomb? Because again, you're not too far from Air, Pope Air Force Base and and yes. And so you decide you're just going to take it on yourself to uh, to dig a fallout shelter. What I thought was really fun was your comment, which I've heard many times from many people, of the school drills 
and, and yes. you questioning the teacher, do you think it'll really help to draw the blinds and, and crawl underneath <laughs> the wooden desk? <laughs> the fact that you actually questioned her about that, I thought was kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah, that I, I loved, I've always loved geography. I love the muse, I love maps. And I, I can remember as a kid finding uh, Brinkley and Huntley on the evening news. They, did, they only did a 15 news cap, minute newscast back then. It wasn't a half hour, it's 15 minutes. I would watch it every day and I knew that the Cuban Missile Crisis was happening. Um, and uh, and then as as that was was over, I, I was absorbing as much of that news as I could, and I'd go to school and and, and number one, my parents didn't seem too concerned, um, and I guess they had a lot other issues that they were having to deal with. I I my uh, my sixth grade teacher would uh, Mrs. Britt, uh, who is the subject of a couple of these stories. Uh, would have us to get under our desk and do drills. And I can remember looking out the big north facing window, looking for the mushroom cloud and wondering would I see the cloud first or hear the boom uh, and trying to convince my parents that we needed a fallout shelter and they would have nothing to do with it. So I just took it upon myself to decide to dig one. Um, probably not thinking that through real clearly, but the story is about, a lot of the story is about the digging uh, of the shelter and, and what happened. And, and again, the, the, the lack of uh, acknowledgement among my, from my parents that I was digging this big hole in our backyard, they just let me dig <laughs> until it was time to fill it up. And then I had to fill it up, so. <laughs> Well, yeah, and that that struck me because there were a lot of stories when we had the uh, some of the school shootings that kids, uh, middle school kids, would go out into the schoolyards after that and dig holes under the under the fence uh, and not even tell any of the teachers about it because they thought they might have to escape quickly. So, right. sort of the modern day. Um, uh, version of that anxiety, and you, you hope that you develop again some better resiliency from having faced some of that anxiety. Uh, not yeah. entirely clear that's happening with the uh, with the shooter drills going on in schools. Right. Uh, yeah, based on some of the things I read. But um, so we we do have a question here, Chris. Uh, yes. How have your grandchildren reacted to the stories about your life and your youth? Um, they've loved the stories. Uh, as I said, I, I, I haven't told them quite all of the stories, but the ones that I've told them, they, uh, they ask over and over. I, and I started telling the stories because when I started trying to read to them, um, because of the dyslexia, reading is a real challenge for me. And if I tried to read something like Dr. Seuss, it's just a disaster. So, um, Finally, my wife said, well, why don't you just tell them stories? So I started telling them stories instead of trying to read to them. And, uh, and they love them. And, and uh, they, once I've told one story, if I tell it a second time and I don't get every word right, they correct me. They tell me that I didn't tell it right. That's not the way it is. I have to tell it exactly the right way each time or they, uh, they, uh, they don't uh, like that so much. But and I, and what I would encourage people to do is just just start telling their grandkids stories. You know, don't it doesn't have to be a big deal. They they like just little simple stories. And I've found that if if it has any to do anything to do with animals or injury, they really like it. And if you have animals and injury in one story, it's the real hit. So they they like that uh, they, they like that and they love hearing the stories over and over. I think there's something reassuring about that to them that they just it's like reading the same book over and over. They just like hearing the same stories over and over, which for me was really good feedback about what to include in the book. You know, sort of their their responses and their reaction and what did they want to hear more of. And uh, so I, I I tried to use that a bit to help guide what I was what I was doing. Well, I, I was really struck. One of my friends wrote a really nice book for their future generations, uh, and they have a whole bunch of grandkids. And he, he wrote the book about kind of the history of some of the family. 
and how things evolved to where they are today. But yeah. he left out a lot of the stories of his youth. He reads your book and he goes, oh my goodness, I, <laughs> I left out probably one of the most important pieces. And that is, you know, being able to connect with my, well, sometimes my kids, but even my grandkids and great grandkids in a more visceral way. And you started off this uh, webcast talking about that, that, that somehow you connected with them in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. And this was a place, I, I think part of what I wanted to communicate was this, this farm I grew up on, my dad's farm, where he had 10 brothers and sisters, but one mile down the road was my mother's family farm. And there were 10 kids in that family as well. And these two families had been neighbors on neighboring farms since 1740. So there's a tremendous amount of history there. And then there's the, uh, the two institutions that were critical. One was the, the Methodist church, which both of my grandparents belonged to. So I've, we probably spent more time in that church than anywhere, not just for church, but for every family gathering, every reunion uh, happens there. And, and then the second one was the elementary school. Uh, which was Barker 10 Mile Elementary School, which was the, the other place that we spent lots of time. So we, we didn't go out to dinner. We didn't, vi we either visited grandparents um, or we went to the church for something or we went to school for something. I mean, those, were, those two institutions were really uh, central to that very rural um, community. Yeah. Well, and so a lot of folks, I'm sure, who are watching this uh, and many that we talk to are so worried about the uh, current social media trends and the fact that sometimes they see families sitting around and every one of them is looking at their mobile device and they're not actually interacting. So good for you that you, you know, develop some things to get <laughs> get the grandkids off of uh, I, I'm sure they still play video games but <laughs> oh yes and I, that's I think that's a challenge for all of us <laughs> yes yep absolutely well so so tell us how you went through the actual okay I'm gonna make this into a book how did you make it happen um it it was trial and error it was a lot of, of a process that really evolved. Like I said, I didn't start out with the intention of writing a book of 14 stories. I started out with three. Uh, I wrote those. And the, the really interesting thing about this process for me was that I had, uh, I had some, of these, some of these memories are 65 plus years old. And so I had these, some sort of, a skeletal framework for a story that I could remember. Uh, there was the one about the pitchfork. There was the one about, um, you know, playing cowboys and Indians with my neighbors who were Native American from the Native American Lumbee tribe. There was uh, my first football game when I didn't even know how to put on the equipment because I'd never seen it before. So I had some ideas of what I wanted to write, but what was really fascinating to me is that when I started writing, um, I started remembering. And I started remembering all kinds of details to add to these stories that I just, if I hadn't tried to write it, I wouldn't, I, don't, I never would have remembered those things. Again, I don't believe. So I started thinking about more and more detail. The stories grew. As the stories grew, then suddenly I realized that I was, uh, telling a second story inside this first story and that had to be its it had to be a story of its own so I'd spin that off and then I would have new memories of, of stories that were just sort of were demanding to be told that I had forgotten so it was a it was very much uh, a process of that evolved it was very iterative it was um, sort of write something down. Uh, I, I, wasn't, I didn't consider myself a writer, so th th this was one of the challenges. Um, so I, I went to uh, some sources like Masterclass has some great programs in, in how to write, little short uh, programs that you can take about how to write a memoir, how to write a short story, how to tell a story. So there's, there's some, some uh, 
good stuff there that you can utilize. And so I did that. I I read a few short stories, uh, particularly uh, I read um, one by a guy named Daniel Wallace who teaches at writing at UNC Chapel Hill. He wrote a book called Big Fish. And it was a lot about his, a memoir about his relationship with his dad. And because I had a bit of a challenging relationship with my dad, it, it just resonated with me. So I, I, uh, I was able to do that. I read, um, uh, some, I don't like write, reading other people's memoirs much, but I did read a couple just to kind of see what is a memoir, you know, what 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 gets included and what can it be and what are the um, possibilities. So it was very much right. Uh, I would think at some points I thought this is it. I can't do anymore. I'm done with this. I would leave it sometimes for two weeks, sometimes longer. I'd come back and read it again, and suddenly. Uh, the floodgates would open and I would see ways that I thought I could make it better. So it must have been, you know, 20 rewrites of just going back and trying to make it better and trying to make it better, getting feedback from people uh, about, you know, and, and the other thing I discovered in the process that, that came a little bit late was that if you're writing stories like that, what I discovered was that if I, not just reading them to myself, but reading them out loud to myself was really important because you, it's a different experience reading it and saying it out loud and seeing how it flows and what works and what doesn't work versus just reading it to myself. For me, that was uh, very insightful. It came a little bit late in the process, but what I would do the next time is, is tell the stories whenever I could and read them to myself and, and, uh, and then look, look for ways to tighten them up and cut out stuff that doesn't need to be there, you know, that doesn't add value to the story. And, uh, so, the other so thing how, I discovered how did is, it then become this finished product? Um, it became that through, uh, I actually self-published that. And I hired, um, and there are a number of places that you can go to, um, to do that. There's a, there, there, and I can give you some of those resources if people are, are, are interested. But I, uh, I hired uh, an editor, a woman, a local woman who's written three or four novels. Uh, and I think is a very good writer. And, and she used to do writing when I had my company, she, she would help us with some of our, our writing. Um, and in a years ago, and I did a book um, called Dangerous Opportunity, which was just a work related book about some management mo leadership models we created. And we, we self published that. So we went back to the same publisher and did that and, and basically uh, you sign up with them and they take you through the process. They get it printed um, and, and, uh, and it, it helped me to have someone here to do that. But they also offer those resources as, as well. You know, you, you, you can you buy a package from them and you can get whatever services you want in that and they will help you through the process. You know, we, we ended up using um, a local artist to uh, one of the things I wanted to have in the book were illustrations. Because uh, at some point as I moved along with this, I thought I want this really to be kind of a, a piece of art. I want the stories to be as good as I can make them. And I would like to have illustrations because my grandkids don't know what a pitchfork is. My grandkids don't know what a mule pulling uh, plow looks like. They don't know what an old box black and white TV looks like. Uh, and so each story has an illustration, and then there's there's a map of the farm, there's a map of the bigger community that we were uh, a part of. So I found an artist, a local artist, who helped uh, with I sort of sketch out what I wanted, and she could make the illustrations uh, for me. So I did a lot of that on my own, but the, these publishers have those resources available to them um, from them as well. So there, there's some good guidance out there. You don't have to just make it up, you know. And if you're interested in doing it, I would suggest that you check into some of them. There's a there's an organization online uh, 
organization called the Author Learning Center, and it works with self-publishing writers as well. It has lots of good little programs and resources from how to outline your stories to how to get them published to how to market them, uh, how to use social media. I mean, there's a, there's a number of good resources, which for me was kind of fun because it was, you know, in addition to writing, it was, it gave me something new to learn about and to try that I really knew very, very uh, little about when I, when I got started. Yeah, which uh, going back to our fourth quarter fumbles research, um, learning new things like that is part of what keeps the brain more resilient. So yeah, yeah, um, you were inadvertently, uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, putting off getting uh, dementia or other. <laughs> other I don't issues. know about that, but we'll see. <laughs> Depends on who you ask. But <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. But it, um, it does. It certainly. Um, yeah, in, in, in some ways, it was like learning another language or something. It, it, there was a lot I didn't know. I am not a creative writer. Um, uh, and it wasn't just about how, how to write, but how do you structure a story? What does that look like? Uh, what are the components of, of a story? What is, what is a memoir? How do, you, how do you write it? How do you, and then all of the details and logistics of how, how do you bring this together into a book into something real. I wanted something real tangible that I could touch and that my grandkids uh, could touch. So, yeah. Well, uh, and one of my great mentors who wrote a, um, a uh, number of books, I, uh, I think it was over 25 books actually on, on leadership and uh, a variety of topics. He said, uh, three pages a day is all you need to do. And you don't even have to do it every day, but eventually, right. eventually you're going to have something that then you can go through uh, that buffing and polishing. And yeah. and for our listeners, anybody who's interested in any of those resources, just reach out to us. We will be happy to share those uh, that Chris has talked about. Uh, we also have a uh, network friend of the firm who she has done uh, audio versions where she will record people and their stories and then she is a storyteller she will put it into a story actually get it down in writing um, so it's a lot um, uh, easier in term for those who don't feel like writing as their thing but you already heard Chris say writing wasn't his thing and he made it happen so you know, I, then as I, I, one last thing I would say to people is uh, really think about who you're writing the stories for that, that was, th these are things that I, nobody told me that I had to figure out. So I was pretty clear when I started that I was writing them for my grandchildren. And I had to keep reminding myself as I progressed that that was my audience. And it, it didn't mean I'd want, I didn't want other people to read it. And I've had a lot of other people read it, but that, but that I kept remember, trying to remember who I was writing this for and keeping it straightforward. Uh, the other thing is just start. Just put some words on a piece of paper. Don't you know? And and uh, you can always come back and make it better. You know, I kept saying myself, I know I can make this better. I don't know if I can make it really good, but I know I can make it better. So I will keep. I will get it as good as I can make it. You know, in a reasonable amount of, of time. And um, another thing I would say is, don't let perfection be your enemy. You know, your grandkids don't. They want the stories. They don't. They don't have to be perfect. So just, just, just do it and um, and tell the stories as well. Because I think that telling the stories really helped me to uh, understand how to write them as well. Well, and I uh, strongly suspect, Chris, that your grandchildren understand you better now as a result of these stories than they understand their own parents. Yes. Who have probably not opened themselves up to being as vulnerable about, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, you know that the, the, uh, Dennis. That's true. And uh, one last thing I, I say is that there, there are sort of two interesting things about this process that uh, I didn't anticipate. 
One was uh, that I thought these stories were just about me in some remote little place in Eastern North Carolina and that not a lot of people would relate to it because my peers tended not to grow up the way I grew up. I grew up more like their parents or their grandparents grew up. And uh, what I found was that there's all people connect to the stories. My neighbor here grew up in Germany. And one of my stories is about our first television that we got before we even had indoor plumbing. We got it so my dad could watch the UNC Kansas National Championship game that UNC won in three overtimes in 1957. And it was the first thing I ever saw on television because he brought it into the house that day and I had to stand and hold the antenna while he and my uncles watched the game. And my neighbor read the story and just came over immediately and said, we got our first TV so my dad could watch Germany play France in the World Cup. And that was why we got a television. So the, the, the idea that there's, that people really connect to the stories in a way that I wouldn't um, have anticipated. And then the, the second part is just around this, um, I decided I wanted the stories to be as honest as I could make them. And I, I do think in the process of doing that, I, I know I felt like I was making myself vulnerable because I was sharing stories that I think for much of my life, I would wanted to have hidden and not, uh, that wasn't the persona that I had sort of developed as an adult. And so uh, it's sort of going back and being honest about those stories. And what I have found is that people uh, frequently come up and people I've known for years are telling me stories about themselves that I didn't know, but I think they feel comfortable telling me because they read my story. And that's been a learning and a benefit that I just, I don't think I would ever have anticipated had I not um, gone along this journey. Very interesting. Chris, uh, again, thank you for sharing your stories and the, uh, the where's and the why for's of all this with our audience. Uh, fascinating stuff. And again, e even if there's no uh, extra vulnerability connecting to grandkids, I think the stories are just fun. And yeah. um, <laughs> so well, yeah. well done on the final product. Thank Thanks for letting me uh, talk about Barker Finland. All right, and for our audience, uh, as usual, these programs have been recorded and will be available shortly on our YouTube channel, and you will get a notice about the recording of that. And with that, uh, we will call this a wrap. And again, thank you, Chris, for all your wonderful insights.